Russia says it has successfully tested a new hypersonic anti-ship cruise missile in a move hailed by President Vladimir Putin as the a great event for the country. Joining me now live to discuss is Jason Israel, former Pentagon advisor and a commander in the US Navy Reserve. Jason, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Danica, and thanks for always uh, mentioning my Navy Reserve affiliation. As a reminder, as I'm not on duty, these views are my own. Firstly, Jason, what are the capabilities of this type of missile? Sure. So it is a hypersonic missile, and it does have the capability to be nuclear armed. So those are the two big headlines that you'll see. After you see the sort of speed and the ability for it to be able to uh, carry a nuclear payload, you also want to look at the range. So in this case, uh, this missile uh, has been in development for 20 years, um, and President Putin last year announced uh, that it would be able to have a range of up to 1,000 kilometers. I believe this test uh, was about half that, about 450 kilometers, but it was verified as a successful test. Um, now, what you see is in countries, uh, there, there are countries that love to celebrate, you know, their president's birthday with such things. So it was President Putin's birthday, and uh, on his birthday decided to have this, um, this missile test. Um, so just to be able to sort of celebrate and say happy, happy birthday to the president. Um, but we have seen this um, in development for a while, and it is a major statement that Russia is trying to make. Um, that they are that they have this capability. Yeah, happy birthday uh, to the president with a new missile, uh, Jason. Mm -hmm. Now we know that the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty it expires in February. The U.S. is urgently seeking to broker a nuclear arms deal with Russia before the November election. How big of a mm -hmm. challenge is this for world powers? Well, it certainly is, and it's going to be symbolic of whether uh, the U.S. and Russia want to come together in that sort of uh, that sort of timeline. So, putting the election aside. Um, and the previous uh, missile we talked about, Zircon, that would, that would actually fall in sort of the medium range, the intermediate range. And if you recall, the U.S. Uh, pulled out of the intermediate range nuclear treaty last year, which has allowed Russia to continue sort of developing uh, these missiles. Uh, the U.S. pulled out of it saying that Russia was in violation of it, but there's been no uh, real p uh, progress toward um, re-implementing that treaty. We also have the strategic arms treaty, as you mentioned, um, so, you know, due to expire in February. And you're starting to see some reports that uh, the U.S. and the U.S. is really trying to push hard to get at least some kind of agreement on paper, uh, probably at least to be able to show some progress before the election, but also because it's actually difficult to turn around that kind of renewal um, by, by February. The way it states right now, it could be renewed for five years. Um, before February, if both countries agree, Russia has shown the in interest in doing that. And the question is, what will the details be? The U.S. has shown that they want to include China um, in an arms deal uh, going forward. But China, of course, has rejected that. So it puts that on shaky ground. And what will this mean for Australia, Jason? Because, of course, Australia purchased U.S. anti-ship missiles only a few months ago. Right. Uh, so part of the Prime, Prime Minister Morrison's big announcement was that $800 million uh, Australian dollars would go toward uh, purchasing the AGM-158, uh, which is the U.S. long-range anti-ship missile. Uh, the way that Australia and really anybody that wants to get to their, their you know, toe in the water of military strategy in the region is you can think about each of these missiles and just picture circles around, and that is the maximum range of each one of these missiles. Um, so you figure if Australia has a land-based capability um, with that range, let's say 500 kilometers or so for the missile that it's purchasing, then you would think that Chinese uh, or, sorry, uh, any adversary ships um, that would move toward the Australian coast um, would have to keep that distance or they would uh, be under threat of those missiles. So each year increase that range and the speed, it says something to your adversary about what your capabilities are. I want to move on now because this week the US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo met counterparts from Australia, India and Japan, a group known as the Quad in Tokyo. Can you take us through what the significance is of this Quad? Right. So NATO is a formal treaty alliance, right? The Quad is what they call it an, in, an informal uh, group. So it actually started in 2007, um, India, Japan, Australia and the US, and it was to be uh, discussing regional security and hold some military exercises. Uh, well, China pushed back hard against uh, the countries that uh, were coming together in 2007, and basically uh, the quadrilateral initiative, as it was called, and we call it the Quad, um, was sort of uh, dead for 10 years. In 2017, um, as China started to, uh, uh, to reassert its influence in the region, uh, the countries started coming together informally again. And China once again came out and spoke out against this group, saying that uh, China, that these groups, that these countries were trying to contain China. So that's the word you're going to hear over and over again, um, that China is concerned that other countries are trying to contain uh, China's influence and growth. Um, just this past week, a major step forward occurred because the countries met in Tokyo. And even though they usually just talk about regional security, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo made very strong remarks 
um, stating that China was an irresponsible actor in the region and that is a, uh, that they need to uh, work together to combat China's coercion in the region. So what you saw was in this sort of 13-year history of the Quad, um, you're seeing a, 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 a evolution toward being more against China by name. And so Australians should really pay attention to uh, that, how often they, they see the Quad either mm -hmm. holding military exercises or meetings. Yeah. And then the next step would be for it to become a formal agreement. Yeah, and I guess uh, more important now than ever, really, Jason. Um, what about Donald Trump this week? He announced on Twitter that he wants to bring all US troops home from Afghanistan by mm -hmm. Christmas. Uh, it's taken many officials by surprise. What does it mean for peace talks with the Taliban? Would they claim this as a victory and would it further complicate negotiations? Right. And as you said, this announcement came over Twitter and we've seen many announcements take Pentagon officials by surprise uh, that have come out over Twitter. So we'll sort of set aside that that is the, the style of communications mm. and leadership um, coming from President Trump. But what the interesting thing is, is that in February, the Taliban and the U.S. signed a peace, a peace framework that was designed to get the U.S. troops out of Afghanistan over the next two years if the Taliban met certain milestones, including meeting with the Afghan government, which they've only begun to start recently doing. So the big question here is, if they left before December and before the Taliban held up their end of the deal, what, what does that mean? And a lot of people are saying that, um, that this actually just removes the U.S. leverage, really for no reason except for President Trump being able to say that he brought the troops home. And of course, that was an election promise of him for, of his four years ago, saying that he wanted to bring people home from overseas. The Taliban would certainly cast the U.S. withdrawal before the end of these talks as a victory of its own. Um, so it really muddies the waters there. And what we'll, we'll see in the coming weeks is clarification on that policy. And what about from a practical level, Jason? How difficult would it be to disentangle what's been a 19-year military presence in just over two months? I'd like to think that uh, the U.S. military care can accomplish just about everything, <laughs> uh, but that's that's impossible. I mean, we just have a 19-year, very uh, heavy military presence, contractor presence, a lot of facilities that would have to be dismantled. So some people would have to be there for that, that period of time. That said, I recognize that at the highest levels, um, sort of what we would call a commander's intent to remove all of the troops um, would uh, sort of lay a stake in the ground that that's the intent. The practicality of it is much more difficult, but it would still send a strong signal even if that order went straight through to remove the remaining about 5,000 soldiers um, from Afghanistan, um, even if it was impossible to do the, the actual full removal by then. Jason Israel, we have to leave it there. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. Thanks, Danica. Have a good evening.